Hi guys, uh, thanks for joining me today. Uh, in this video what I want to discuss is uh, training drills and how to uh, drill properly and get the most out of your training drills. Uh, some of this I think I've touched on uh, in other videos as I've sort of talked on um, and, and gone off the subject a bit. And so I've mentioned parts of this but I just want to bring it together um, into one video so it's um, easy to find and everything's in one place. Um, so what we're going to be focusing on here is yeah, really just uh, what are training drills and why do you do them and how can you get the most out of them. So to start with, let's, let's look at okay, what is a training drill? Um, why, do we, why do we do them at all? You know, what's the point of doing training drills? And uh, probably worthwhile stopping and thinking for a little bit uh, for a second. Just think to yourself, when you do your training drills, you know, why are you doing them? Uh, the answer, if I have to give my own answer about it, is um, the way I view them now is my training drills are there to obviously improve my table tennis game, but to improve it by turning something that at the moment I'm doing consciously, turn it into a subconscious process. So that when it comes to a match, I don't have to consciously think about it. Okay? That's what I think my training drills, at least how I am approaching the idea of a training drill, is I want to be able to use my training drills to turn a conscious process of concentrating on some particular aspect. I drill it consciously so that I improve my ability to do it and I get to the point that I can perform it subconsciously without having to think too much about it so that I can then go out and do it in a match. Okay. For me, that's why I do training drills. That's how I'm basing around it. Now, that gives you the idea that sort of every drill has a reason. It's, it shouldn't be just something we do, oh, I've always done this drill, therefore I keep doing it. You should give a little bit of thought to your training drills. Now, even with this sort of making um, something from a conscious to a subconscious process, there's still, I think, a, probably two um, aspects to training drill. One is learning a, a new skill, learning something that's completely new. Uh, it might be uh, learning how to backhand loop. It might be learning how to uh, do a swivel push with long pips, anything like that. But basically learning a new skill um, that, you, that you haven't mastered. So that's one area we use training drills. Another area, part of it, is actually sort of um, kind of practicing an established skill and making sure it blends in or really you know, works in with the rest of your game, I guess. Um, and they, they kind of start to merge. Um, as you get better at the, the skill that you're learning, you're going to shift it from a focus on performing that skill to actually blending it into your game. And then your drills for that will be slightly different. So it'll shift as we go along, the type of drills we'll do. Okay, the drills that you do to learn a new skill are going to be different for an established skill that you're still trying to work in and make sure it's part of your game, or keeping some of your established skills, still trying to improve them a little bit more, um, making certain aspects more automatic, um, along the way as well. So uh, both of those aspects are important. And I will touch on both. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention was that in terms of drilling and table tennis, I, I think it's important to also have the right attitude when you're drilling and when you're doing your training. Um, to have the right attitude can make a big difference. What I mean by that is the way I recommend people to do drills that I'm going to discuss with you later is the idea is that you're going to make life difficult for yourself in some of these drills. You know, you're on purpose going to make it so that you actually fail a lot of the time. You make a lot of mistakes. So it's, it's not going to be a case of trying to make sure that you do everything perfectly with no mistakes. Okay. In a game, sure, that's what we really would like to do. We'd like to make no mistakes in a match. 
But in training, that's not always going to be the focus. It's actually going to be a case of trying to put more pressure on ourselves so that we do make mistakes, so that we know we're actually working hard uh, under some pressure and it's not too easy so that we do improve. But you have to have, you have to be aware of that because it's important because otherwise it's very easy to get frustrated by the fact that you are making mistakes under, in your training. So if you go in, if you go into your training with the approach of, okay, I want to be perfect in my training and I never want to make a mistake and mistakes are bad, then doing, trying to drill well is going to be very, very difficult because you're going to come from the point of view of, I want my drills to be so that I can never make a mistake, I can perform them flawlessly. But those sort of drills that, you know, firstly, you're, a drill that easy that you never make a mistake is probably not working you hard enough. You're not going to be really under enough pressure to improve. And secondly, it's, it's not a great mindset to have because as humans we will occasionally make a mistake anyway. So you're, you're shooting for something that's impossible. So much better to go in with the mindset that, okay, I'm going to make my training drills difficult so that I have to concentrate very hard to do them successfully. There will be some mistakes because I'm under a lot of pressure. And that way, you know, you keep trying to reduce the mistakes, but when you get them down to a certain level, you go and make things harder again. That's the right attitude, I think, to have in terms of your training drills. So it's, it's striving for a good success rate rather than striving for perfection. Okay? All right, so having touched on that, Let's talk about these two kind of aspects, I guess, of uh, training drills, which is would be, firstly, you can talk about training or learning a new thing and training an established skill. And those are the two areas that I'm, I'm going to work on. Now, in both cases, before I get into those two things, the idea behind this drill, or the idea that I used behind my drilling, is that I want my drills to be difficult but not impossible, okay? but not too easy either. I don't want them to be so easy that I'm not getting any benefit. So where I kind of work from, as you would have probably heard me say before, is that I try to have the difficulty of the drill so that I get roughly a 70, 60 to 70% success rate. Okay, So there's quite a few failures along the way. And my goal is to try and improve so that I can get it up to roughly, say, a 90% success rate. Not perfection, but, but sort of 80%, 90%. Once I've got to that level, I will make the drill harder and I'll try and step it up again. So rather than sort of going for wait, I'm not, I'm not trying to make it so easy that it's perfect. And I'm not going to wait till I'm perfect before I make the drill a bit harder. It, it's actually kind of, it's not really, really easy, and I'm not trying to make it super hard. I want to be in that 60 to 90% range of success. Start low. As you get better and get up towards 90, then it's time to make the drill more difficult. Get it back down to 60, work your way back up, make it more difficult. So it's, a, it's an incremental process, is, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, as regards to that drill, okay? That's the way I approach my, in general, my training drills, um, both for when I'm trying to learn a new skill and when I'm trying to work on an established skill and keep it sharp or make small improvements. That's where I'm aiming for. It gives me something to work on. It gives me a, a measurable way of knowing when to make the, more, the drill more difficult or also, if I'm failing a lot, I know that I have made the drill too difficult, I need to make it easier. So it's an easier way to kind of get uh, an idea of whether to make it easier or harder and whether I'm improving. And, and so I find that quite useful. So that's the framework of the drills that I, that I do. That's the idea behind how I perform them. Now let's just take a quick <coughs> example of learning a new skill, a completely new skill. Okay, and there's a few of you out there in the course who are obviously quite new to long pimples or anti-spin. So we can, we can uh, use an example of that uh, at, to 
just to give you an example of how you would learn this new skill, or at least how I would approach it, or if I was trying to teach a student um, face to face, how would I approach the drilling, how would I set up my structure of drills. And this is the kind of idea what I would use is because it's a new skill, okay, um, the student doesn't have any real, real um, skill set. So everything they do is going to be very, very much a conscious thing. They're going to have to concentrate hard on one thing um, before they can go to the next step and make it more difficult. And any of these shots, um, are, as you know, quite often there's several things going on. So we actually have to start simple, build up, before we can get to the actual complex part of using it in a real match easily. So let, let's take a simple example here. Here I've mentioned um, a backhand loop, learning to do a backhand loop, which for people who are using ant, uh, a long pipper and anti-spin, being able to twiddle and hit a backhand loop is often quite handy. But it can be any stroke, the principle is the same. So let's imagine you've got, uh, as a player, you have no skill whatsoever at hitting a backhand loop. Okay, so how would I start? Well, what I want to do is I want to start them as simple as possible so that you only have one thing to think about. So where I would start is probably actually what I would consider give them the simplest variation, give it to one spot so they don't have to think about moving, try not to vary my spin too much so they always get the same thing, and then all they really have to do is stand in one place and concentrate on playing the stroke. So I'm trying to remove them having to think about too many factors. I just want them to be able to think about playing the technique. Okay. So what I would normally start with in that kind of example is I would start, I would block, give them a very um, ball with a little bit of light top spin off the block to the same spot as much as possible so they don't have to move. Um, so there's not a lot of variation in spin and really all they have to then think about is basically play, 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 just so they can get the feel of the technique. Okay? And that would allow them then, we would work on that until they're comfortable and probably in this case to start with they'll probably find that okay, they may miss much more, much more than 60%. If so, that's okay. I mean it's really just a technique thing, learning to play the technique. Um, if I found if they were really, really bad and only getting 20% on, and say for yourself, if you're trying to learn a new stroke and you, you're only getting 20% rather than even 60, I would probably take them off to do some shadow play and get them in the mirror and practice the technique in the mirror without even a ball, just so they can groove the stroke without having to worry about is the ball going on the table. So if I needed to, I'd walk them right back to that. So it just varies how well they're doing. If they're around about 50%, if they're getting half on, half off, that's probably good enough for me to start with, just to learn the basic stroke. But if less, I'll take them back to shadow play. But the idea being is, okay, <coughs> they're playing that stroke against a block to the same point every time, and when they get themselves up to around about an 80-90% success rate, I want to make the drill harder. But I don't want to make it too hard. So the next step I'd normally introduce there is I, you've got a few choices. Um, you could change, do something simple and just change the pace a little bit um, or change the spin a little bit. That, that would be one way to go just to make it a little bit more difficult. Um, because that way, you know, they do have to make a minor adjustment to their stroke. Now, so just a small change in pace without really changing the spin. Um, or sometimes what I'd also do is actually just put it to a slightly different location so that they actually play the same stroke, but they have to move their feet just a fraction. Okay. Either way, that change is going to make them miss a few more. Uh, I personally myself would probably put it to two locations um, a little bit apart so that they should just have to just move a little bit um, and shuffle maybe a little bit 
because that way they can play the same stroke, they're just learning to shuffle their feet, but with the same basic stroke. Now, assuming that they have the ability to play a forehand or something, they should be able to stroke and move. So this shouldn't be too much of an ask to say, okay, hit it, move. But the same ball is coming at them in two different locations. Now, obviously, if you're a complete beginner that you were trying to coach that didn't know how to stroke and move at all, that might be a bit tougher. But I'm talking about for people like yourselves who aren't beginners, but are learning a new stroke. Now, you know how to move your feet. So for you, the idea of just being able to move a little bit is not as bad as a complete beginner who really doesn't know how to move in table tennis. So this is what, for you guys, I would probably do next. So I'd still block, same spin, just to two places, so you could play your same technique and just get used to the idea of moving the feet. Okay? Now, again, you've got choices of what you would do next. Um, I could continue training topspin uh, against, you know, against your block. What I'd probably do now, though, is now that you can topspin against a block from two locations, I'd probably start getting you to do it off a push and make you learn in one location to the same point, learn the different swing angle for a push. And once you've got your skill up to about 80-90%, I would push to two locations. And you're playing the same stroke against the push from two different locations. So by the time you get that up to 80-90%, you now know how to play against a block from two locations. You know how to play against a chop or a push, play your backhand from two locations. But you don't know how to put them together, you know, in one sequence. So that would be my next, my next step. Stepped up another little step to make you, I would block and push and block and push to one location. And you now, you don't have to move, but you do have to, against a block, against the chop, against the block, against the chop. So you're now, I'm taking away the ability, the need to move, but I'm making you change your stroke based on the spin. Once you learn how to do that, I will bring in the movement again. And now you're going to go block, and maybe a chop, you know, or, or from two locations, maybe block, hit one off a block, hit one off a chop. Move, hit one off a block, hit one off a chop, move. And maybe then change the order around or something like that. But the idea being is now you're going to read the spin, but you're going to always know it's a, it's a simple pattern, always the same pattern, but now moving and changing your stroke. So you know what's coming, there's no surprises, but now what you're doing is you're changing the angle of your stroke for the different spin and you're moving. Okay. When we get that up, what we've now got is where do we go from here? I would probably start to now move you to a random location in your backhand. But I would give you one spin. So I would now block you anywhere. You, but I'd always be a block and you would now be playing the backhand. But it could be here, here. So now you don't know where it's coming but you know what spins on. Once you learn to do that, I'll do it with the push. So again, you don't know where it's coming, but you know it's always backspin. And once you know how to do that, I'll step you up to, you don't know, or well, I'd probably actually make you do one block, one push, one block, one push to a random spot. So you always know it's gonna be off a block, off a push, off a block, off a push, but you never know where it's gonna come but you do know the sequence of the spin. And once you're comfortable with that, I would vary the spin and the placement so you don't know what spin, you don't know where it's going on your backhand. So now you have to just basically read the spin and move. Once you learn how to do that up to about 80, 90%, I would probably start to bring in an occasional ball to your forehand. And by now we're starting to get to this stage where you're, you're probably pretty automatic on the execution of your backhand. 
Now what we're working on is blending that in with the rest of your game, and that's why bringing in the forehand. So that sometimes the ball's going to come there, and you're going to have to play a forehand instead. But I, I want to do that in my drills. I want to do that fairly, for me, fairly late in the process. And the reason being is I want you to have plenty of time to get the stroke technique feeling automatic. So it's no longer so much a conscious, okay, this is what I've got to play. Against a chop, I have to swing up. Against a push, swing there. Against a block, swing forward. When you've automatically learned how to do that, you won't have to think about that too much when I actually shift the ball to your forehand and play your forehand. So I want you to have plenty of time to master the technique before I start making you think about whether it's going to be on the backhand or forehand. And that will make things simple. If I bring in the forehand side too early, you'll still be trying to think about where your technique is, what technique, how to play it, and I've also made you worry about whether to hit a forehand, and things are going to get very difficult very fast. So I, I bring that in late. That's how I work. Um, and that would probably be at that stage, you've now got the backhand working, off chop or push or block, you've got it working in random places here on your backhand, you're occasionally getting it to your forehand, now you start, you're really ready from this point onwards to start thinking of it as probably an established stroke and you can start working on it in terms of um, improving it incrementally, making it part of your game. So you now start to use a lot more random drills blending it in backhand and forehand where there'd be a higher percentage of forehands and backhands so that you would actually start to make it part of your natural your drills would be closer to match play is all I'm really saying and we get to that kind of stage so that would be my process now you don't have to follow that exactly but the theory is just really um, learning any new technique whether it's a stroke whether it's a, a footwork style, you know, learning to cross over your feet, whatever. Start simple, give yourself a chance to concentrate on the skill itself, whatever it is, get that to a good success rate and add something a little bit extra to complicate it so that you're then having to think about that little new thing while trying to perform what you've learned automatically. And then when you get to that stage of being able to do it fairly, fairly well, you bring in another new thing. And really all it is, it's just this over process of you're learning something consciously, you're thinking about it consciously. When you get to the point that you can do it fairly well, fairly unconsciously, as shown by having a high success rate, you bring in something new, that new thing makes you think about the new thing and you are now forced to do what you've just learned fairly unconsciously, okay? And as you get better, it's really just building on that skill, making it more and more a subconscious thing. So in this case of the backhand, from going from a simple backhand loop against a block to one place, by the time you get to the point where someone's moving at random and changing spin and occasionally hitting it to your forehand, the chances are pretty good that you're no longer thinking very much about he's blocked it, I've got to swing forward. He's chopped it, I've got to swing up. You're now thinking more along the lines of where's the ball going? Where's the ball going? What's my opponent doing? You're not thinking about what technique you're using. You're now thinking about reading your opponent because you're automatically using the technique. And that's the idea of the drill. Okay, so that's the idea of learning a new skill. You keep it simple, you complicate it, and you keep building, making these conscious decisions, conscious concentration on technique. You make it part of your subconscious so you don't have to think about it too much. When you're practicing an established skill, so let's just think about in terms of, say, for most of us, you're practicing your forehand. Or for some of you guys who have practiced, um, played with long pips for a long time, you know, you'll push with the, um, the pips. Something that you can do automatically, you don't have to think about it. You know, you've done it, and it's just part of your game. How can you practice that better? Now, 
what that tends to come down to is occasionally you may want to um, improve the technique a little bit. You may want to modify it a little bit and just try and tweak it. Um, an example would be me when I changed my forehand technique. You know, I had a forehand, it wasn't a great forehand, but it was automatic. It was the way I always played it. And it wasn't good technique, but I didn't have to think about it. So to go to a, when I changed my technique, I had to go back and start consciously thinking about how I want to play my forehand. And I'm getting now to the stage where I'm, I'm almost not really having to think about it much at all now. It's become fairly automatic with occasional lapses. Uh, but I really did have to go back and simplify my drills to back to a very simple drill because I was tweaking my technique. I needed to consciously think about what I was doing. But if I wanted to now take that forehand that I've learned, my new forehand, which I think, now I want to just improve it as part of my overall game, how do I want to do that? Well, now that it's established and I don't really think about it too much, with the limited time that I have to train, and probably the limited time that you have to train, the more things I can get done at once in a drill, the better, provided I can still perform in my 60 to 90% range. So what I'm trying, the type of drills I'm doing with my forehand now, I'm trying to work as many things at once, so that in my 20 minutes of drilling that I have allocated to forehand, I can get as much done as I can and use it efficiently, okay? Because firstly, I don't have a lot of time and I don't necessarily have a lot of fitness. So I can't spend hours at it. I have to get everything done really efficiently. So the kind of drills I'm doing now is I want to, when I do my forehand drill, now that I'm comfortable with my basic technique and I don't have to think about that very much, I'm now working drills that will work as many things at once. So I'm going to do drills that will work my footwork and make me move. I'm going to do drills that make me choose and play the ball from different locations. I'm also going to bring in drills that, at the same time, don't always go to my forehand, so I have to choose between a backhand or a forehand or into my elbow. So I'll work at that. And I'm going to get my, my feeder or my opponent to vary the spin so that it's not always the same spin, so that I have to pick a backspin, a block, a counter loop. Because that way what I can do is in one drill for my forehand, if I've got my opponent feeding me blocks, chops, or using multi-ball, this is where I, I really am using the multi-ball these days, my feeder is giving me balls to different locations with different spins. Um, so I have to play, making me move, so my footwork's coming in, I'm working my decision making about what type of stroke. I'm working my decision making about forehand and backhand. Um, everything's getting worked at once. So even though I don't have a lot of time to drill, I can work on all of that. Okay. Now, if you can see, I'm, I'm working on say maybe four different things there. If I wasn't getting a high success rate, so if I wasn't getting at least sixty percent on, I would get my feeder to simplify the drill. I'd get him to take something out until I can get at least 60%. Because if I'm only getting 40%, it's not doing me much good. I'm, I'm actually missing more than I'm getting. So I'm not, I'm training mistakes more than successes. I'm under too much pressure. So that's, that's what I'm doing now in terms of my forehand drilling, is I'm no longer doing simple forehand, 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 or forehand, top spin, lift the ball, forward, lift the ball. I'm now moving and blending it in with my backhand and different spins because it allows me to effectively work things, a lot of things at once. That's just my forehand, but it's the same um, if we were doing our backhand push or even just on the backhand side here. You can be working in, okay, do I hit it? Do I push it? Do I get the odd ball there? Do I twiddle? Once you've learnt these strokes, it's more efficient to have them all working at once together. You can get more done. So the type of drill I would do for my long pips would be, again, a similar thing. I would be here playing the balls, all sorts of spins. 
all sorts of locations. I'm going to twiddle and I'm going to push and I'm going to drive. I will roll. I will chop block. I will hit some forehands. I will twiddle and try and hit with the forehand pips. And I'll work all of that at once, work all my decision making, all my techniques together. Because the basic strokes, the basic technique, I know. I don't need to sit there and go over and over. I need to now blend it in and get more things done at once. What would be different though is for me if I was trying to work on my backhand uh, drive with the long pips, which I really don't have much skills with, that one I'd actually just have to go back to a simple skill. Same place, bang. Same place, bang. Same place, bang. Two different spins or two places. Here, 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 here. And I'd build it up. Um, and it's, it's really just a matter of if you have an established skill you know, that you've, you already have fairly automatic, you, know, you don't have to think much about it, it's subconsciously done. The more things you can do at once in your training drill, the more, the more efficient it will be, provided you're not making the drill too, too hard. And how do you know it's too hard? If you're getting less than 60% success rate, it's probably too hard. If you're getting 95%, it's probably too easy. And this is where some of the basic drills that we often do, um, you know, the opponent blocks, and you're looping away and you're thinking yeah I'm getting all of these on great <laughs> what, what it's making you warm you're already maybe repeating that automatic motion but you're not probably getting much benefit from it and that's uh, I guess my approach really in a nutshell with drilling is firstly uh, just to recap my drills are there to turn the conscious decisions that I have to focus really hard on, whether it's a stroke or footwork or um, decisions whether to move one side or the other. My drills are there to make that conscious thing that I have to think hard about to get right, turn it into a subconscious process that I virtually don't have to think about at all. And the drilling is just there to take me from a point where I have very little subconscious skill and I have to do it all consciously with little room to think about anything else to take me to the point where now I can do it subconsciously and my brain is free to think about more important things such as what the hell is my opponent doing what spin is really on the ball um, where is it going um, and things like that <laughs> so yeah, that's the idea okay the drilling itself is on the principle that I know I'm drilling and I will make mistakes because that's how my drills are designed. The amount of mistakes I make is what is telling me whether the drill is too easy, just right, or too hard. Okay, and I use that as my adjustment. As I make less mistakes, I increase the ability of my, the toughness of my drill and keep working. Uh, I use, probably in my cases, I try and make most of my drilling now working established skills and only one or two things on building something new um, just because I mean I've been playing a long time most of my game is quite mature um, so I don't need to practice and learn a lot of new things I do need to work on my established skills and try and do as many things as possible with those drills for people such as some of you out there who are new to long pips new to anti-spin if you're training, if you've got an hour to train, I would think maybe maybe 20 minutes on learning something new and not too many new things at once. Try and, try and probably stick to learning one new thing per day you know, or per session. And you may need to work on it for several sessions in a row, but don't try and learn two or three new things in your training drill. Okay? One thing at a time for maybe 20 minutes out of that hour. And the other 40 minutes, work on stuff that you already know, trying to get as much done um, in those drills. The Chinese did some research and sort of found that if you're learning a new skill, if you do one new thing, whatever that is, and you sleep on it and you come back the next day, you're better. If you try and do two or three new things, sleep on it, 
it, it's not, it doesn't work as well. Um, your brain gets a bit confused. So one thing at a time is probably best. Um, but that's really uh, my approach to drilling. That's what I'm doing now. Uh, as an established player, most of my time is spent trying to learn, uh, keep my automatic skills going, doing as many things as I want, as I can, so that I'm working a lot of things at once, getting the most out of my time. But when I needed to learn a new skill, such as changing my forehand technique, I went to back to simple drills on it, I then built up the complexity until eventually got back to the case of doing the more involved drills. Um, simply because it, it wouldn't have worked for me to try and do the completely new technique with a very difficult drill. I wouldn't, I'd be concentrating so hard on my technique, I wouldn't be able to do a lot of the other stuff or the other decisions that I also need to make. So for new stuff, start simple, build up. For established stuff that's already automatic, try and bring in extra things so there's more decisions going on and that way you'll get a better use of your time. Um, and that's it, so um, thank you again.